Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Joseph Trevisani for Worldwide Markets. Uh, once again, I thank you all for attending. I'm always greatly complimented that people take time out of their day to listen to what I have to say, or at least to look at the pretty pictures. We all know that they're not coming from my jokes, since they're all not all that funny, and there are very few of them. A couple of normal comments that we make here. Um, if anyone has anything that they'd like to say or any comments they'd like to do, please just type them into chat or let me put up the Q&A as well, and I'll be glad to stop and uh, listen to what everyone has to say and comment on it. I prefer to run these as uh, interactive rather than as a lecture. Today's topic, uh, the British election and the European project. I deliberately chose the wider implications of this um, as the topic because the what happens in Britain today, or in the next two weeks or so, I suppose, as the, as the election is actually decided, because it will likely be a coalition, um, has implications for the wider de democratic approval or disapproval of the European project. The British are not an integral. I mean, they are, they are very much a part, but they are very much a part in both of its senses, senses, a part and a part from the continent. This has been the history of Britain for, well, forever, for 2,500 years. And nothing has changed now. There were late joiners to the European Union. The European Union's um, was actually put to a referendum, which is a lot of talk nowadays, in 1975 after the EU, after Britain joined the EU in 1973, and it was voted through. I don't actually know the numbers on it. Today's situation is very different. Um, as a matter of fact, the parties involved are kind of are reversed. In the 75 election, the referendum, the parties were the supporters of joining the EU, and the Labour was largely opposed to it. And there were backbenchers and uh, factions on either side. And the situation is largely reversed now. I'm not saying all the Tories and the Tory party is against uh, staying in the EU, but certainly there are stronger feelings in many of the, for many of the Tory MPs that a new relationship needs to be forged. It needs to be renegotiated, shall we say. And I think the concerns now, well, let me talk about that a second. And also the UKIP party, which it stands for just the United Kingdom Independence Party is foursquare against being in the EU. So you have a you have a reversal in that sense. But let's go back a little bit and try and tease out the various strains that are going through both the British electorate and countries and electorates on the continent, which I think is the more interesting fact here. What we have up here is a chart of the EU, of the, uh, the euro and the sterling. And the main difference in the chart, of course, is the uh, steeper fall in the euro from January until now. And that's uh, largely due to the ECB's quantitative easing project. The British have been doing that for a while on a much smaller scale. OK, now. There isn't a lot of information in that chart about the election. Well, part of the reason is because the election is very much undecided. The government that they have now, the coalition between the Liberal Democrats, or as they're called in Britain, the Lib Dems, and uh, the Tories or the Conservatives, is only the third coalition uh, par government that has ruled Britain, I believe, since the turn of the 20th century. That's 100 and 115 years now. The other two were during the two world wars, First World War and the Second World War, when they had national unity governments, I believe, as they were called, rather than coalition governments. But they're the same thing. There was a great deal of consternation in Britain that this government would not be able to function well. And in fact, it has functioned reasonably well. Um, if I had to make a prediction on this election, and I will, since that's my job is to do prognostication. It would be my my get that the that the conservatives and um, Cameron pull it out 
simply because the British economy has performed reasonably well despite everything over the past five years. Let's take a look at some of those things and compare them to the continent and compare them to what goes on on the continent. This is probably the most emotional of all of them. This is UK and continental unemployment. Now, this is EMU. This is not Germany. Germany's is approximately what Britain's is, a little bit lower, I think, actually. Um, some of the countries are actually lower. This is a reasonably good performance. Here's another one. Uh, let's look at retail sales. Again, the EU is yellow. Britain is white. Let's look at manufacturing PMI. Same situation. Britain, the continent. Britain white, continent yellow, EMU. Um, here we go again. All of the all the white on here are the uh, are the British. Inflation, or as Mr. D um, Draghi prefers to look at it, dangerously incipient deflation. Well, that's another story. Um, again, the British have performed better by their own by their own norms, which of course the central bank's norms are we don't have enough inflation. Not to discuss that particular topic at the time, at this time. Services, PMI. Oh, this I'm sorry, this is unemployment. I put this one up already. My apologies. Okay. Um, what did I put this service? This is actually unemployment, but I have it listed as services and I may have doubled two charts my apologies um, this is uh, what is this this is, this is the composite PMI for Britain in the white and Europe uh, the EMU in the yellow industrial production now these are reasonably similar um, in fact part of the time the Europeans are doing better but right lately Britain seems to be doing a little bit better, except for this final fall off right here. And let's see, GD. Now this is the this is the one I like. This is GDP measured, I believe, the same on the same way between Britain again in the white. I started all these charts up Bloomberg um, uh, with Britain, which comes up white. Uh, it's the default and EMU, and you can see the very profound difference from 2012, 13, and 14, and into 2015. So for this, Britain's closest economic partner, competitor, trading partner, is, of course, the continent, the EMU. And when you look, I'm suggesting that when British voters look at this chart let's give here's another one um see what this one is hang on okay i see what these things are this is uh da, 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 year on year and this is quarter quarter to quarter but you get the same result let's look at the year on year one so when you when you when you look at these charts from a british voters point of view you end up or yeah, i'm not saying you do but the knowledge is that britain has performed reasonably well under the uh, stewardship of, of Cameron, the Conservatives, and Nick Clegg uh, of the Liberal Democrats. So it's my guess that will maintain. But let's look at some of the specific. I remember uh, in 1992 when John Major was running and expected to lose um, after Thatcher had been forced out. Um, I think it was running against Neil Kinnock, I think. I'd have to check that, and I forgot to check that. I happened to be in the in the city of London, in the city, in the financial district on business when I was working for Credit Suisse. And I was there for a couple of days. And, and the run up to the election, everybody in the financial district, everybody in the city was very worried, depressed that Major was going to lose. And these rabid uh, redistributionist laborites i'm not saying that's what they actually were but that's what everyone said they were that i spoke to in the financial district thought that the you know the uh well the end of days was upon them um 
and then Major pulled it out. And the, I mean, <laughs> I remember very well election night. I was out, of course, in, in a pub with, with a number of people from our office and many, many other people. And the, it was like Britain had just won the World Cup. I'm telling you, in the financial district, everybody was absolutely overjoyed, slightly inebriated, became far more inebriated. But it was a very joyous evening, and it was very much a surprise. Um, Major had been expected to lose, and all the polls had said so. So I don't know where we are now. I have a, a sense that we're in a similar situation, but I haven't been to Britain, so I can't really say. So anyway, now the British run there for, for my American uh, my American friends out there. British run their uh, elections in a much more controlled fashion than we do. Uh, exit polls, there's only one. The British polls are open till 10 o'clock, which Boris might very well be prime minister. Um, the man has great political presence, great charm. He's funny. He writes well. So it might very well be. Um, and he's certainly a conservative. And he's um, anyway. OK, so the, the election, as it will turn uh, so anyway, back to the, the, tech, the, the technicals of the election. So the first thing I'm arguing here is that the British economy has, by these charts, performed better than its continental partners. The. Contrast between the Tories and the and the Laborites, um, in general, although not true in every specific case, is that the Tories are more antagonistic towards the European project than are the Laborites. Laborites are very similar to the Social Democrats um, throughout much of Europe. Um, their domestic programs are closer to theirs. And so there's that affiliation. So when the electorate has to decide on how close their relationship with their uh, fellow Europeans on the continent are, this will certainly be a factor. OK, so on to the technicals. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to explain the British parliamentary system. Um, many of you probably understand it. Many of you probably understand it better than I do. Um, I being an American, I'm used to a representative democracy that runs in a different fashion. However, the leader of the party that wins the most number of seats automatically becomes the prime minister. It's the parties that are voted for in Britain rather than the individual prime minister. In the United States here, we exalt, we elect a president. We either voted for in the last election um, Barack Obama. We decided to choose Barack Obama. That's who we voted for, not the party. The parties can go in very different directions. Okay, sorry. So in Britain, that is, the, is those parties that are elected, and that's the list, and that, that's the way it is. It looks now as if, uh, at least according to the polls, nobody will have a majority. And then, much as just happened in Israel, there is lots of deals, bargaining back and forth on who will obtain enough votes in coalition with other parties to have a majority uh, or at least have a voting majority in the parliament. In the United States here, you know, you either voted for Obama or you voted for Romney, and that's what's elected. And the, and the legislature can go in very different directions, as it did. Obama was elected. He defeated Mitt Romney and the Republicans gained nine seats in the Senate and now control both houses of Congress. That something, something like that cannot happen in Britain. The prime minister is a creation, is a function of control of the House of Parliament. OK. So the specific situation in Britain now is fascinating. Because you are seeing currents, the same currents that are running through politics in. Yes, I'll talk about that in a second. I mean, I am not I'm, I'm, I can't talk to with too much detail and too much uh, personal knowledge about the British political situation and the British political system. Um, it's not my specialty, but I have a general sense of what's going on. And my interest, of course, is what how. It how this election interacts with the world financial system, specifically 
the euro and what's going on with all of the tensions over the euro on the continent and how it reflects mass sentiment in Europe. Okay. So the various parties, um, there are two primary, three smaller parties. Now, you know, much of, much of the European political scene um, depends on coalition governments. Not all of them, but many, many situations there, that's the case. Um, Britain has tended towards a dual party system. It is moving away from that clearly, which also is fascinating. So let's look at that. In Britain, you have the Tories, you have the Laborites. Uh, we have uh, Cameron and uh, Miliband are the two leaders of those two parties, the two largest parties. Looks right now that they're going to run about uh, 34, 35 percent each, at least according to the polls. There are the Liberal Democrats, who I believe had about 30 seats in Parliament uh, under the coalition, headed by Nick Clegg. He is Deputy Prime Minister. It is thought that they will be losing representation. Then you have the UKIP, United Kingdom Independence Party, an anti-EU party, or as they like to call it, they're a Eurosceptic party. Um, they want to leave the EU. They want to uh, – their leader, leader is Farage. Yes, I forget, his, I forget his first name. I could check it out for you. Um, if anybody knows it, put it up there so you can remind me, please. Um, Neil, perhaps? Nigel, thank you. I had Neil. Thank you very much. And they are natural allies for the conservatives. In the last election – Last general election, they did not win any seats, but they, I believe, have two seats that they won in special elections since then. It, they are an unknown quantity. It is very hard to judge, since they have had very little performance in the pe in election of performance, how they will turn out. If they end up taking seats from the Liberal Democrats, then the result, as far as Tories go, is negligible. Um, if they gain seats in other areas – then the results are pro-Tory because they're a natural ally in a coalition for the Tories. There is one wild card, and not making any puns on this. That's right. The most likely thing, you're absolutely right about that, is that UKIP takes seats and votes either from the Tories, most likely, or perhaps the Liberal Democrats, not from the Laborites. That's true. So there isn't any, any net increase or net change for a potential Tory coalition. That is true. The last party, and I, having just watched the Game of Thrones last night, I shouldn't probably bring that up and now, except that the the North in the uh, in the, the American novel novels, the Game of Thrones, is the Wildlands. Um, anyway, so let me retract that. If there's anyone who's Scottish out there, I do not mean to cast any illiberal aspersions here. Um, is the SNP, the Scottish National Party? Now, there was a independence vote in Scotland in, I believe, 2014, last year, very recently. Do we remember how excited – I wrote a number of columns on this – that the markets were that they, this might pass. <laughs> the North using means Yorkshire. Okay. I don't think Hadrian's Wall defines the, the border of Scotland anymore, but I think it's pretty close. I'd have to check that. So if anyone out, if anyone knows better than me out there, please, please correct it. I did not check the maps and the ancient Roman maps before I came in. But the Scottish National Party under Alex Salmond lost that election rather handily for Scottish independence. It is now thought under their new leader, Nicola Sturgeon, I believe, or Sturgeon, or her name. I don't quite know how to pronounce it. I remember once I had, I had a very, very active evening uh, in Bermuda on the trading desk with one of my colleagues who was from Glasgow. I may have told this story, and I think we ended up doing maybe three yards that night between the three of us there. That's $3 billion of trades. That's a lot of trading um, with various customers we had that night. Um, it was a wild night. And at one point, um, and, and I had only this is like the first time I'd ever really worked with him before. And he had a quite heavy Scottish Scottish accent, and I'd never really encountered it in a trading room before. And after a while, so we were shouting to each other across the across the floor, 
what our positions were. You know, I just did 50 million euro. I just did this. I just did that. So we could all keep track of what we were doing. Um, and eventually, I was having such a hard time understanding his Scottish accent that eventually I just said, uh, Derek, just keep your book. And because I was in charge of the trading room, keep your book and we will talk when it calms down. Literally, because I could not understand in the excitement and the noise what he was saying. Um, it's my first encounter under pressure with a Scottish accent, a lovely and charming accent. And I do mean that um, it, it's a very beautiful accent, I find. But it was very hard to understand that evening. At any rate, so the Scottish National Party. And this is what's fascinating about it. And this, I believe, is the main impact on the sterling, uh, on the British relationship with the EU, and in fact, on the British election itself, and I'll talk about why that is. So the Scottish national vote failed. I believe it was about 5%, if I remember. Scotland had been, prior to the, this election most likely, or has been prior to this election, largely a labor stronghold. Almost all of the 59 seats um, in Scotland went to labor. It is expected that in this election, they will almost all go to the SNP. Now, the SNP lost its last vote. In some ways, the relationship between Scotland and Britain, Scotland and England in the United Kingdom, is similar to the relationship between the UK as a whole and the EMU and the EU. They are associated. They have had a long and successful relationship. Yet they are distant and seem to be growing more distant. And they seem to be falling out of like with each other. The policy, the pri now the, the SNP is akin to labor in its domestic policies. It's a social democratic party. You know, they want um, minimum wage, welfare spending, more on that side than the other side. I suppose you can make the general analogy, although it's not a great one. It's the Republicans here. Uh, to many kinds of analysis, in the end, is probably not all that useful. Reflecting is simply a natural tendency in industrial. So for the SNP, their natural ally is labor. Now, it is quite possible in Britain, because of the parliamentary system, to, in the United States, Whichever party has the majority, the greatest number of, of seats in both uh, legislators, uh, the House and the Senate, controls the Senate. They run the agenda, they chair all the committees, and they essentially run it. Democrats used to run the Senate, the Republicans run it now. Harry Reid used to be the chairman, um, Mr. McCullum is chairman now. Okay, so, in Britain, it is possible for the a minority government, meaning they have fewer seats in parliament to still be a ruling government if they can form a coalition with another party that will give them majority. And it isn't necessarily that they have to have majority, but they simply – that's the great question. I'll talk about it in a second. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Um, I think it would. And in fact, I don't think Britain is going to leave the EU, but I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So it is quite possible to form a minority government. And this is something that could happen. And this is probably Labour's best chance, because if Labour has a number of seats fewer than the Conservatives, but all of the Scottish seats, or most of them, go to the SNP, then it's quite possible that the British, that, that the government will be headed by Milliband because in the event of a confidence vote, which is really all that matters, the SNP will vote with 
labor and maintain Miliband's premiership. The problem for that, for labor, is that the primary policy and reason for the existence of the Scottish National Party, regardless of the rejection of the Scottish independent vote less than a year ago, is to create more separation between Scotland and England. The actual policy, the actual uh, platform of the party is Scottish independence. And it is very, very risky for a British English political party to be allied and depend on a party that is devoted to the dissolution of the union between Scotland and England. So that is a serious consideration going forward because if the if Labour gains power through dependence on the SNP, it is quite likely that the SNP's program will be resented in England, and that will devolve onto the heads of Labour. So it's very risky. But again, we don't know how this is going to play out. That's the most likely thing. So now let's talk about the possibilities for impacting the British economy, but primarily Britain's relationship with Europe and the impact it may have on the sterling, since after all, our primary concern is the, are the currency markets. Britain's largest trading partner is, of course, the EU. The EU, as a originally, you know, a customs union, which is how it got started. Actually, the first was a coal and steel pact and the customs union. And what does that do? Well, it's with customs borders. It makes trade infinitely more easy, infinitely easier, as the euro has done for currency exchanges across the continent. So if the UK left the EU, then the trade barriers would not encompass the isles. They would start at the other side, as the French call it, Le Manche, which means the English Channel. The French call it something different than the English do. The French do not call it the English Channel. They call it La Marche. March, Manche. To brush up on my 17 years of French. Um, and that is to no one's benefit. Okay, so now, where are we? The current prime minister, Mr. Cameron, has promised a, a referendum on EU membership. It's expected to be in 2017. The UKIP, that's part of their party platform. The Liberal the Lib Dems are one way or the other on it. Um, they will support, I believe, the referendum. Now, how will that impact the market if the Tories in coalition retain power? Will this panic everybody? Will everyone start selling the sterling because they think the Brits are going to cut themselves off from the continent? The British economy is going to be affected and everybody's going to hell in a handbasket. And my answer to that would be no, no, and no. That's probably not going to happen. First of all, as far as the markets go, 2017 is a long time away. Second, they could very well and I think likely vote to remain within the EU. And third, I believe that the primary purpose of this, as both exhibited by the uh, UKIP program or platform and by the Tory approach to it in general, um, for the UKIP, it is not largely an economic issue. It is an issue of bureaucracy, if you will, of culture, of imposition of controls and regulations, primarily out of Brussels. The EU Commission, the unelected executive government of the European Union, which is getting a lot of resistance on the continent as well. For the 
Tories. It is largely a reflection of pressures from underneath. Again, largely along these lines. And the purpose of it, I believe, is to renegotiate some of the terms of association between Britain and the EU, the terms of its membership in the EU. I do not believe now that the Tories in general want to leave the European Union. Its benefit to trade is too great. The UKIP are not addressing it in those terms. They are approaching it from a far more emotional point of view. So even if, and let's just say that's true, that the uh, Cameron and the Tories retain power, that would, of course, make a UK-EU referendum uh, would guarantee that it's going to happen in 2017. This, I do not believe, will panic the markets. It may give a small... Uh, negative for the euro, but the sterling, but even that I don't believe will be very powerful at all, if at all. So as far as that goes, I don't think we're going to see any effect. Next one, the if the if Labour, with help or backing from the SNP, take control, will there be a referendum vote? Um, it, it's less certain that there will be, there might be, especially if it appears, as has happened over the past six months or so, that the polls are trending against leaving the European Union. Um, so that will cause even less consternation, I think, in the city amongst currency traders of its effect on the Sterling and on the British economy. The, the Labour, uh, Miliband may actually elect to have the referendum. Um, I've read a number of comments on this simply to get it out of the way, especially if they think that they would win it. And I think they probably would. In, in the long run, it's my opinion in the long run that Britain will not, that the British electorate will not vote in a referendum to leave the European Union. Okay. There is, however, one consideration, and I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but it is, I think, the strongest impact, potential impact of the election. And that, of course, is the SNP. Their platform, although they're not talking much about it now, is largely independence for Scotland. How that's going to work out was one of the reasons they lost. No one knows, meaning how would the details of it actually work? They're going to use the they're going to use the British pound. They're going to use euro. I remember all of this very recently was very much a topic for discussion. They are in this election downplaying this particular aspect of their program very strenuously, and it's very sensible as to why they are because this does not play well in England. It does not play well with voters, English voters. If Labour gains power with the backing of the SNP, which is one of the actually slightly higher betting odds in the British betting parlors um, for the outcome of this election, it will guarantee a great deal more scrutiny of what the SNP says and does. Because the greatest threat, I think, to both the British economy and certainly to the sterling is dissolution of the union between England and Scotland. That is potentially, at least, the real threat from this election. I don't think it would happen immediately, though. I tell you, if Labour wins with SNP's backing, I think you will get a fall in the sterling. I'm not quite sure how much. I don't think it's going to be a wholesale sell off because it is very risky for Labour to be seen to be associated with a vociferously anti union party. And it's not known yet whether or not that will be the tact that the SNP takes. 
My guess is that they will not because they know this. If I can sit here and say this and you know this, then the SNP knows it as well. And it is a pro- – since they just lost a straight up and down mm-hmm. independence vote, their likely approach to the topic and the fact of independence – Hold on a second. I'll see if we have any comments here. So I'm just looking for uh, where's the where's I'm just looking at the Q and A here. Wait a minute. There, the the Q and A does not seem to be coming up. So if anyone has a question, don't type it into Q and A, please. Type it into chat. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. I just found it. Very good. Oh, you just did that. Thank you very much. You're ahead of me. I appreciate that. Um. That's a good question. You know, let's let's take a look at to answer that question. Let's try this. Um, how much will it sell off? If it's, I think it will sell off. But, but let's t- let's do this. Let's look at the. OK, so this is what we're looking at um, for the, the two year trend on the year and a half trend on the sterling. We've had a recent bounce here, but most of this particular bounce here has been due to dollar weakness rather than to any particular strength in the euro or the uh, or the um, or the sterling. So I would say that we're going to get that you could probably that, that you're going to get a you're probably going to get a you might get a sell off back to trend line, which would be which would be somewhere around 1.5 or perhaps a little lower. That would be my guess would be a reaction as far as because it's, there's nothing determined here. So you're going to – it's still within the trend. And so that's, that's probably what I would say where we go if you draw a trend on this right now, if you're looking for a particular, a particular uh, prediction. Okay, so let me continue here. So the, the – let me just put one more up here, and I'm going to move on to one other topic here uh, in a few minutes in, – in two minutes because we only have 45 minutes today because I know there's another one here. Okay, and I want to put up, up the wackiest chart I've got here, and it's – which one? Where's my th- – this one. I love that chart. Okay. That's the Shanghai Exchange. Shanghai Composite. Land of Lakes. Look at that chart. Anyway, I am not from the Midwest, but I have been reading the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, the Little House on the Prairie books to my daughters, and they are absolutely wonderful books. They are truly great books. Um, and Land of Lakes is something that they would say in that book. Okay. So, so the result, so the, the danger from the, so back to the SNP. If the SNP um, goes into coalition with the, with Labour to form a government and put uh, Miliband in the prime ministership, my guess is that having just lost a direct election on the topic of independence, that the SNP will not push a public, a program of dissolution and independence. They already lost an election based on this, and they tried. My guess is they will move slowly and gradually to enact their program. So you will not see if that occurs, if, you, if that is the particular um, government that they get, Labor and SMP, you will not see, at least from its leaders, a sudden increase in independence rhetoric. So the markets, although they will have a reaction against it because they know that this is the background and this is the long-term project for the S&P party, will calm down. They're not going to get too excited about it because the S&P is not going to promote it because they know that they have to move their own electorate in Scotland, a majority, to that idea. They failed, and they know they failed. They lost the election. So I think that's going to be, have less – long-term effect, or at least medium-term, uh, medium and short-term effect, than they will. Okay, what are the other currents that are playing in this election? And this is what relates to the world economy as a whole, and specifically the world economy since 2008, more so 12, 13, 14, and 15, with the advent of worldwide Quantitative easing. Everywhere. Everybody's doing it. Well, maybe Bermuda's not doing it, but everybody else is doing it. 
This is a chart of the Shanghai Exchange. It's not a moonshot. It's not Apollo 7. It's not a bottle rocket. It's not fireworks. It's the Shanghai Exchange. It's a stock exchange. Now, this, it is particularly an egregious example of because of liquidity and all sorts of other reasons. Nevertheless, it is a stock exchange, the main stock exchange of the second largest economy in the world. Da -da -da -da, this is serious business. Does anyone think this is sustainable in any fashion whatsoever or that it's not a bubble? As uh, some radio commentators like to say, there, I said it. Okay, let's assume that it's liquidity problems in – it looks a little better here if we only look at a year, okay? But let's look at some of the other charts. We'll do the same thing. This is the Nikkei in a year. This is the Nikkei from 2008. This is the Nikkei on 30 years. we got another non uh, – oh, this one doesn't – this is – the Japanese is a – and it is a singular case because of their bubble back in the 1980s. And okay, they've never gotten close to back there. OK, but this is, again, the increase in the slope of these lines is something that should give every central banker nightmares. But apparently it's what they wanted. OK, let's look at the Dow. Dow, one year. Looks reasonable. Dow, five years. Looks a little bit reasonable. Dow 30 years. The slope on this line is steeper than the others, but not appreciably. The problem with it is here. Is this short, the short space right here since 2008. This right here. Okay. It's not so bad, though. Let's look at the S&P. One year and S&P 2008. As you can see, over time, from, two, from, the, from, the, uh, from the financial collapse on, the ascending line of the equities gets steeper and steeper. Let's do the same thing with the FTSE. I'm going to go through these very quickly. One year, financial crash. Again, back here, this is the problem. What is that reflection of? European QE. Who's their greatest trading partner? The Europeans. Okay, here's the 30-year. And now look, in, in the context of history, look at this line here, the European QE line. You can barely see it, the slope here. And just to show you that it is not incorrectly drawn, this is a close-up for that. Okay, let's go through the DAX. One year, again, the line of ascent increasingly steepens. And the farther you pull back into history, in comparison with history, uh, I don't know who will be uh, broadcast the election. Oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you that. Let me just finish this. Anyway, so this is the the steepening line, and here is the DAX on the th – is that this one? Yeah, that's – okay, this is the, the DAX on the 30. Look at this final line here. This is not a type of move that can sustain itself. Okay, back to your question. Uh, I'd have to look. No, I'd say that 45 degrees is far steeper than, a, than the normal type. Because remember, what we're talking about in equities, um, and what you want is the long-term trend. You, you get bubbles oh, through here. This is the DAX. You get a sense. You get falls. But it's the main line down here that – gives you the overall trend and actually reflects the size, the growth and the size of the economy. Nothing in these, in these charts, all the charts that you've looked at, none of these reflect anything remotely close to reflection of the size of the economy. This is dangerous stuff. Okay. Now, um, the British elections are a bit more closely controlled than they are in the United States for, for, for Americans here. There are no exit polls. The only exit poll is an official one from the government at 10 o'clock which is released at 10 o'clock. I don't know when they actually do it. So um, 10 o'clock in Britain. I believe that's uh, 5 o'clock here in the United States. I'd have to check that. It's either 5 or 4. I forget which one. Um, that's when results will come out. The results are slower to be reported than they're here in the United States. Um, we probably will not know results, at least here in New York, until um, early morning, if anyone wants to stay up. I'm sure all of the 
trading desks in London are online. Um, where would I go online to look at these? Um, to tell you the truth, I would probably go to Bloomberg to tell you the truth. If I'm going to look at the Bloomberg online site, that's where I would probably go or perhaps the BBC um, for either one of them for uh, straight reporting on this. Okay, so what is the connection? And I'll, I'll end this very briefly because I know that we are um, ending here. And there's another webinar coming. What is the connection between all of these charts and the fragmentation that we are seeing in the British electorate that we are seeing all throughout Europe? And it relates, I think, to the failures uh, certainly on the continent, of the euro to promote economic growth. The origin of the European Union is in the wars of the 20th century. It is not an organic institution. It's a treaty organization. And the more – and its bargain, and I've said this before, um, its bargain is similar, at least the euro's bargain, is similar to the economic bargain that the Chinese government has with its people. And I'm not drawing political analogies here. But economically, the Chinese government needs to deliver economic growth. The euro needs – to benefit, it needs to deliver economic prosperity to the people, after all, who did not vote for it. And this is its weakness. And the desperation, in my mind, of the central banks that are promoting this type of bubble speculation in equities in an uh, effort to save the EU will end up being the danger to the euro and the European Union. And this is reflected, I think, in, in the skepticism, although it is partially culturally based, um, in Britain. And so one of the fascinating things, from my mind, in this election is where the vote for the UKIP and the SNP end up. Both of those parties, in different fashion and on different topics, are promoting an idea which is anti-EU and anti-Euro. It doesn't seem that way, especially in Scotland, but it is a direct counter to the mantra of the European Union, the ever closer union. Okay, folks, I thank you very much for attending. I hope this has been entertaining in some fashion. I will put my email address up there. If anyone has any comments or considerations, I will be watching this tonight um, with my girls. I'm going to talk to, talk to them about it, and then they're going to go to sleep. I'll put my email address up there if anyone has any comments considerations or anything else that they would like to please put them up. Once again, I thank you all very much for attending. I consider it a great compliment that all of you take time out of your day to listen to what I have to say. Hope everyone is well and enjoy the evening. Take care.